yes, we're going to get started on time. Council President will be joining us shortly. So at this point, could I have approval of the minutes, please? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Ayes have it. Thank you very much. We are going to have the monthly investment report, and Connor Thorne and Chris Johnson will come up and present that. And welcome, Chris. You should be able to just hit back because I think I already had it open. Here, I'll get it. I'll get it for you. Sorry. It's okay. Yeah, the third one down. Third one. I'm going to go ahead and share it into the meeting. Thank you. Is it this one? Yeah. I think so. Uh, maybe not, actually. No, it's not that one. Sorry. Nope. My eyes aren't that good. Uh, I'll just uh, do this one. Second one. Good afternoon, Council. Um, thanks for your time this afternoon. Uh, so Mr. Gavin Cooley is unable to attend today due to a flight delay, so uh, myself and Mr. Chris Johnson, our Deputy Treasurer, will be presenting the investment uh, results and our cash balance uh, from the month of August. I'm going to touch, brief touch brief briefly on the uh, monthly cash and investment results, and then um, Chris is going to discuss more of the strategic side of the portfolio. Um, so looking at our cash and investment activities um, for the month of August, um, see it's relatively comparative to um, the month of July. Um, not a significant amount of change um, other than we did move a considerable amount of um, dollars from our cash to our fixed income uh, based on some additional investments that were made um, throughout the month of August. And I'll get into some of those here in the next few slides. Um, this chart here shows a projection of our actual results um, versus our projected results for the month of August um, relative to the amount of cash on hand that we have to invest. Um, main change here between that 118 to the 73 uh, were additional um, investments that were made later on in the month that were initially probably going to be invested in September. Um, but they were pushed into August due to some better favorable um, uh, rates that were coming in for August. And here's a list of some of the investment activities um, for August. All in all, we had about uh, 70 million of investment purchases uh, that were in line with Mr. Cooley and the investment committee's uh, strategy kind of going forward over the next several months. Um, any questions on investment results before we go into more strategies? Yeah, yeah just for clarification Council. then on that last, the, the actual versus projected. So you're saying that the, that, that the actual being lower is actually a good thing because we've moved up some investments to get more favorable rates? Correct, yeah. Okay. It's more of just a, a change in you know where our money is kind of being put and where it's being invested. Um, so that 118 is kind of relative to how much we're kind of holding in the local government investment pool versus investing into, you know, treasury uh, securities and, and bonds and okay. that sort of thing. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. So I'll hand it over to Chris to talk about more of the strategy side. Uh, thank you, Connor. Uh, it's nice to meet you all. I'm Chris Johnson. I'm the new deputy treasurer. Um, looking at the investment performance, we see the city of Spokane's portfolio is at 2.4 years for the average maturity. Uh, the benchmark that we're using right now is one to two years. Now that's a, a little bit outside of the higher end of our benchmark, but we are looking to rein that in over the next quarter or two uh, going into 2023. We do have significant amount of opportunity to do so with capital rolling off of older investments. 
So we seek to put that in, uh, seek to put that to work in uh, shorter term maturities. Uh, in terms of our yield to maturity, we have 2.05%, and that is at the lower end of our benchmark of 3.5 to 3.45. Um, it's kind of a, <clears throat> a unique situation right now. Our benchmark is moving significantly fast due to the Federal Reserve's activities in terms of increasing um, Fed fund rates. So that's pushing uh, shorter term maturities or shorter term maturity yields uh, up higher, quicker than our portfolio can recalibrate. So. Um, again, like I said earlier, um, in terms of seeking to put uh, additional dollars to work as investments roll off over the next few quarters, we should be able to uh, achieve putting that money to work at higher yields. So we should be getting closer to that benchmark number uh, as we go into 2023 and to the mid-2023 time frame. So uh, any questions? Well, thank you very much. Any questions, Council? All right. Thank you. thank you, Chris. Thank you. We look forward to seeing you again, I presume. Oh, yes. Thank you very much. Next, we're going to have up Mr. Hall about our weather ordinance. And while we're waiting, just so you know, if you didn't have the latest uh, agenda, uh, the SBO for the Salvation Army was pulled, and also the LTAC was pulled. Good afternoon, um, Chairman Wilkerson, Council Members, President Beggs. I'm John Hall. Director of Neighborhoods, Housing, and Human Services. Today I'm here um, to present to you just the annual report for the Extreme Weather Ordinance, Spokane Mun Municipal Code, Chapter 18.05.020. A little bit of background about the ordinance that was passed in July of 2021. It outlined provisions for the city to provide temporary shelter spaces. I emphasize, um, uh, on foresight of increased resources uh, and prior planning was also emphasized to make sure we were ready to take care of our Spokane residents and to protect them from extreme weather conditions. Some of the policy responses that occurred uh, to date have been having warming centers activated when the temperature is actually 32 degrees or below Fahrenheit. Cooling centers are also activated when the temperature is forecasted by the National Weather Service to be at 95 degrees two consecutive days or more. And then safe scent air centers are activated for the entire day when the air quality index is forecasted to reach 250 or higher. A bit of overview over the last year or this year of 22 that's happened um, with our cooling centers, we had four activations this past summer. The bottom of the slide will show you the dates. Um, the code, again, requires 95 or higher of uh, two consecutive days forecasted by the National Weather Service. Keep it in mind that there are various weather apps that exist. I learned <laughs> over the last couple of months, my, my phone gave me something different when the National Weather Service would, would indicate otherwise. So. We use the, the National Weather Service for um, the official forecast. During the, the cooling center activations these four times, we were able to uh, uh, have interdivisional collaborations with libraries. They had four of their facilities open uh, during the regular hours, and then we extended them uh, during the hours in which the temperature remained at 95 degrees or above. Part of um, our collaboration with libraries included daily gate reports um, during the time period in which we activated. At no period in time during the four activation periods this summer did the library ever reach its capacity. We, we touched base with library staff throughout the days at, of activation and, and we had daily reporting. Uh, and so even with their, their numbers that were given, we were asking, were any of the libraries at capacity where you may have needed to turn someone away? Uh, and they, they reported 
on all those four activations that there never was a, a time period where they were even close to reaching their capacity. We did have the Northeast Community Center as an alternative in case uh, Hilliard w was uh, over capacity. Uh, so I did want to mention uh, them as well because they were, they were part of our, our outreach plan. Given an update on the, the warmer centers and the results that happened earlier this year, I think many of you may know that uh, this particular activation, we had a lot of uh, lessons learned uh, from it, but going um, by the, the slide here, we utilize uh, the Public Facilities District as well as the Guardians Foundation to actually stand up uh, a warming center in the midst of a, a winter season storm. Um, we had up to 343 guests between the, the peak hours of 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. each day. Uh, mills were served, 9,000 mills during this time period of December 26th to January 9th. Uh, and of course, there was quite a bit of, of damage. Uh, and when we get to the financial slide, we'll talk a little bit about that in, in more detail. But one thing to note now that we have the Trent Resource and Assistance Center open, uh, this uh, uh, center or track, as we're calling it, will replace the existing shelter system for warming centers, cooling centers, and air safe centers. Uh, and that is a continuous operation. As far as the safe air center, uh, we have not had any activations, I think, in the last two years, if I read my, um, my previous reports correctly. Uh, we have not had any this, this season so far. Uh, and again, TRAC will serve as, as the main safe air center when it is necessary to activate uh, due to air quality. A bit about the sheltering outreach. Any time that we have activated the, the cooling centers, uh, we have um, made in, ensured that we've reached out to the, this list of um, organizations that you see on this slide. Our public affairs uh, and communications managers actually are holding meetings and coordinating press releases uh, to alert the public. Um, our newsletters are updated and sent out to subscribers. Uh, we have active social media feeds, uh, as well as our 311 My Spokane staff being um, briefed and updated uh, when the, uh, the activations occur. And we have our 211 system as well. And, as, and the public library staff, one of the, the activations, we did not alert the public library staff, and they were um, encouraging us to always keep them uh, in, the, in the loop, and so we made that modification along the way. Now for the financial picture of the um, extreme weather um, condition or temporary shelters. So the budget for 22, actually allotted or allocated 150,000 for our, our emergency hazard shelters. Uh, we surpassed that with the warming uh, event at the convention center alone. And these expenses are about 381,000. Um, for the cooling centers, we have some expenses that are coming in. We do not have any numbers. Uh, when I reached out um, to libraries, they said they would have them for me next week. But what I do know what we will have is, is about 102 hours worth of security um, for the, the libraries that extended their hours. And like on Sunday, the libraries um, close, I think, at 4 o'clock, and we extended to 8 o'clock. And what I saw in some of the, um, the projections were that um, Securitas was using two security officers per site at each site. Um, and so that's why some of those hours look uh, inflated. Um, and then uh, two days at Hilliard, we had library staff that worked overtime because security did not show. Uh, and we actually have uh, one of the security companies who actually refused to um, provide service at Hilliard. Uh, so uh, that is the is status John, of... Can you, um, can you clarify why they refused to... I, I, I don't know. We thought they were. Um, and when I found out that the library staff uh, worked overtime, that's when it became, came to my attention. So I, I don't know why. And we, we they, they had the staff, we assume, but they just were unwilling. They okay. worked the other locations. 
And where, where were these others, the Securitas and Starplex, where did they provide security services at? So they did not provide um, services at the same time. So Starplex was our primary um, service provider, um, but then the season, uh, as it got later into August, I think there were some concerts, things of that nature, so they were booked and so they weren't able to provide our services when we needed the cooling center activity. Uh, and so the secondary uh, company was Securitas, uh, and that's um, when we ran into those challenges. Mr. Hall, a couple things. So about capacity at the libraries, did each library had its own capacity limit, correct? So downtown versus Liberty Park versus Hilliard. That was one. No transportation cost in any of this because when you said that the Trent Shelter will be our main location, when it was downtown the winter, it was centrally located and most people could get there. That will not be the case um, this winter. So is transportation being figured into the budget um, for the warming shelter as we go forward? You can get with me later. So the transportation costs are, are basically within the Trent, um, or the, what is it, Trent Resources and Assistance Center, so TRAC. Mm -hmm. uh, in that particular budget, there was uh, an allocation for transportation. Uh, and what the Guardians Foundation is doing currently with its ambassador program, uh, whether it's today or even in the winter, uh, anyone who is needing to get to track uh, for, for shelter, they can call their ambassador number and they have shuttle vans that will go and pick up uh, the, the people who are in need. Thank you. Go ahead. I believe. Oh, oh sorry, keep Council President. No, wait, continue on. I have, I have a question. No, I, I believe that was the end of my presentation, so I was. Did you have one, Council Members? Uh, yeah, sure. My first question is about the safe air centers. Um, what's the additional cost of having safe air centers open now since it's supposed to be the Trent Shelter? And the second part of the question is does the Trent Shelter have filters? Because last time I was there, it was a giant fan blowing outside air into the building to cool it off. So I was making sure that they had filters or other ways to prevent the smoke from coming in. So the first question is, I, I don't see uh, an additional cost. Um, we, we dis I discussed it with the fire chief earlier today. Um, now that track is open, it's, it's, it's a continuous operation. Uh, as far as filters, I will have to follow up. I, I know that we ordered coolers for track, uh, and they were supposed to have been delivered, I think, uh, last week or so. Uh, but I, I will need to follow up. But the fans you saw were temporary um, deliverables for the soft opening. Council President, and then go ahead. All right, uh, just yeah, two two questions. One to follow up on that. So, um, would we, in the event that we would open up the the safe air aspect of this, would we also continue to, to utilize libraries and other? Uh, facilities at the same time? Yes, during their regular business hours. So they will not be extended, even if for the cooling um, centers uh, next summer. It will only be with the, the normal business hours since we have track open 24 seven. That will also reduce okay. the, the need for security. So I, I guess, I don't wanna forget my other question, but uh, it's a, just a little concerning because you know when we talked about this two, was it two summers ago? Um, you know, one of the points that was brought up, and I think it might have been Councilwoman Kinnear who, who um, emphasized it most, but, you know, n there are different populations of folks who need, you know, refuge from the, the you know, dirty air, the, the smoky air, or from whether, you know, the temperatures outside. Some people don't have air conditioning in their homes or, or heat or, you know, whatever it might be. And so making sure there's a space available that is safe and accommodating for sort of the broader general public I think is important and the libraries I think fit that very well mm -hmm. but if we're not going to have extended hours potentially not not universally but potentially that could be an issue for some of those folks so I would just like to keep that kind of top of mind as a something that we should be thinking about how we can accommodate those folks who aren't probably going to go to the Trent shelter to seek refuge um, and then but my follow-up question is and it's supposed to be up a year, year ago. Uh, when are we going to get the public facing dashboard up so that people know what's available and when I know there are providers who have said they will just jump on it and start providing that data immediately without mm -hmm. needing a special contract. And so I, I would like to see that get up and running so that there's at least some data, even if it's just partial data, but, but some data available for the public to see and, and who any of us that might want to be looking at that. So 
I, I agree wholeheartedly, and, and my superiors have been on me of, about getting the, the program launched since I, I started. Um, it's simply that, that we're, staff is not delivering. Uh, the last um, communique that I have is that it will be uh, operational on October 1st. Okay. So that's what we're working toward now. That'd be great. Thank you. So my understanding that the plan is for children to get refuge from dirty air at the track? At track is our only safe air center as at, to date. Yes. All right. Yeah. So, I'm I'm I've obviously been a supporter of track and getting it open. It gives us some options, especially for certain uh, demographics in the population that might not feel welcome at um, uh, library and things like that. But I just I find the plan very inadequate for next year. Um, so I've had a good talk with Jen about what I imagined. I really think when it comes to cooling centers and clean air that we need a neighborhood-based plan uh, so that families that um, don't have air conditioning or families um, that don't have clean air can just go to their local school or local church and that we have a network of those. That's when we passed this. That, that was our vision. I know you weren't here, but our vision was that we had a place that people could just go to that would fit uh, where they would be comfortable uh, with the other people that were there and I know it will cost some money, although I think a lot of those places, I was successful last year in getting the schools to open up, elementary schools uh, for families during the heat. Um, but I just, we need a comprehensive plan that we've got locations everywhere and that you can go online and find the closest one and not, and we, you know, the track is again, a great improvement, but we don't have enough space in the track for all the people who would have serious health issues. So I. I'm a little disappointed, not, not blaming you. Uh, I know you just got here, but I just want to be clear that the vision is different than this announced plan, so. Okay. Council Member Kinnear. Uh, and to add on to that, I think the, the rationale was people don't have to um, find out every time there's an event where they're supposed to go, so it's predictable. It's the same every time. And as Council Member Cathcart said, yeah, it was me, I wanted to make sure that it was anybody who has an issue, doesn't have a cool space to be, um, is in a dangerous situation at, at their home or wherever they live, that they can go somewhere and be safe. And so it, I think it's crucial that it's predictable. Mm -hmm. People, okay, it's above 90 degrees, we can go here. And every year it's the same. Mm -hmm. So there's no guesswork. You don't have to blast it out as much on social media, but because a lot of people don't have um, connectivity either. So we, want, we just want to make sure that every time it's the same, no surprises. Duly noted. Council Member Zappon. Do you know any of the history or future plans of working with neighborhoods and churches in that history? Um, Council Member Wilkerson and I were in Vancouver for a conference and talked to the mayor there about their robust network of churches um, and bringing those communities together to do that. Um, we were wondering, we've brought that up and mentioned that to the mayor and to a city administrator, but haven't heard any updates about that. Right. Yeah, this um, activity falls within community housing and human services, so I'm sure that uh, Jennifer Saracides and, and her group will, will be uh, performing that due diligence and we'll get back with you. And then I just wanted to make a point here that what you were presented to us about the warming centers was an activation of only two weeks this winter when we know that the temperature was below 32 for longer than that and shelters were full, uh, dropped down to like five degrees, zero degrees. So I just wanted to point out that what you presented was still not compliant with what the ordinance says. Okay, duly noted, uh, that's the only data that I have. As you may know, our emergency manager director is on leave, so when she returns in November, I'm sure she will have the, the remainder of the data and we can come back with a more comprehensive plan that better aligns with your vision that you have for 23. Okay. Thank you, John. Thank you. Next, we're gonna have uh, Council Member Zappone speak about the safe air dovetailing. Yeah. yeah, it goes right into this. So. Um, this came out of a conversation that, uh, or some emails back and forth that started with the really bad air that we had last week, uh, where the AQI was about 200 degrees, or 200. Um, I was wondering 
we have the Trent building, it's supposed to be our safe site, safe air site. Why is that not open? Why is it not being communicated that the public can go there? So I, I emailed Brian Coddington and he responded saying, we don't actually open it until 250 and listed out the different levels of um, the recommendations of when we pay employees hazard pay and all of that. And so it's at 250, uh, which didn't seem to be a really safe air. And I think the level and the amounts open to discussion. Um, this is a recommendation to update the code to be at 150 AQI. Uh, and the reasoning is that's when the city and the health department say that it's unsafe to be outside and the parks close uh, after school activities are closed to the public saying that we shouldn't be outside anymore. And that's unhealthy for everybody at that, uh, at that level. Uh, before that's only for sensitive groups. So there's some discussion around that. I do hear that there is no additional cost to operating safe air. So I think it's more a, a safe air center. So I think it's more of a, are we communicating it to the public that they can go there uh, when the air quality becomes bad? Clarity, no additional cost, even though we would be open more frequently or longer periods of time. How did you arrive? Well, hearing from Mr. Hall right now, he said okay. that because right. the track is the safe air center that the city identifies, but not for families or kids. It's really only 18 plus. Right. Uh, but he said that since it's already operating cost, it's just a matter of them being there. And I think it would be great for consistency because I know the District 81, uh, they did not let their kids out last week when at the air quality. They kept them all inside so they could not go to the playground. So I think whatever agreement number we come up with, it should kind of be across the board so that everybody's on the same page of what expectations are. So that would be city, schools, county, any Parks. of those groups, yeah. Spokane Clean Air, Regional Health District, that makes sense? Yes. Okay. So that's the rationale. There's some discussion about levels. Um, I know the administration is saying that they're not really in favor of 150 but would be more okay with 200. So that's something that we're open to two, seeing what council thinks is an appropriate level. It seemed to start at, if this is unsafe for everybody, this is the AQI that starts up being unsafe for everybody, let's start there. Um, and that's when our parks are closing too. So why should we not be communicating to the public that there's alternative places that you can go? Is there a process we could get consistency from the agencies who make that call? Clean Air and Health District would be my first thought. If and there's also the, the Regional Health Department. Regional the administration health. also said they were not completely, sorry, I did, I did not completely accurately describe that. Okay. We're okay with 200 right now, and then if we were going to 150, we would have further conversation with someone from the Regional Health Department to come present. Uh, Councilmember Bingle raised his hand oh, on the Thank web. you. Councilmember Bingle. Hey, yeah, sorry, I'm, in, I'm at home today. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I agree with... Uh, some sort of consistency, whatever it is. Uh, you know, my son uh, was supposed to start a sports camp last week and it got canceled because of that unsafe air. And so if the air is unsafe, the air is unsafe. Whatever it is, if we could sit down and, and talk uh, and discuss and figure out whatever whatever the unsafe level is, let's let's be consistent in that. Okay. Thank you. Council Member Catcart. Yeah, is it, can we ask uh, Johnny if, if there's any input on where we're at with this? From his side. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Cathcart, Council President Beggs, Member of the City Council, Council Member opponent. Also, thank you for the conversation earlier, Johnny Perkins, uh, City Administrator. Um, we are not opposed to the 150. We would like to have some further discussions around some data uh, analytics, mm -hmm. analytics in terms of information, five year history of where that has been. Uh, certainly concerned with um, individuals' health and safety. As a football official, two Fridays ago out at Ridgeline High School in Liberty Lake, uh, I think we were at 131. We could see the, the uh, smoke in the distance, and uh, the administrator said, hey, when I come on the field, it's 150, 151, this game, this game is over. Fortunately, we didn't have to do that, although the next day on Saturday, I was officiating a game where I did have to call it in the fourth quarter because it was at 155. So we're not opposed to that. We understand the health concerns. We want to be mindful to that and respectful. But we'd like to see some more data uh, on that in terms of making sure that that is consistent across uh, uh, all uh, aspects of our operations. Great. Thank you. Thank you, City Administrator Johnny Perkins. Well, I think we look forward to more discussion to come around that. Next, we're gonna have up Heather. 
tweet from uh, My Spokane. Welcome, Heather. Thanks. Good afternoon, Council. Um, I'm here to request for some additional expenses to cover some expenses that we don't have in our current budget to this year. Um, we're looking at a salary savings from our vacant program professional position, um, where we would take the funds from that position that has been open since January of this year, and we approximately have about $42,000 in, in um, savings this year. Um, and I am actively working with HR to fill that position, hopefully by the end of the year. And so we are asking to take $30,000 of that $40,000 to purchase hardware for new hires and also existing staff for new workstations to eliminate the sh our <coughs> existing sharing of workspaces. So we would purchase four laptops, 12 monitors, four USB hubs, four headsets, which is approximately $18,000, along with purchasing five workstations, which is approximately $12,000. Um, so currently today in our department, we have 11 workstations, but are approved for 16 FTE. So we have five, five workstation deficit that I'm looking to resolve and eliminate that because it's just no longer feasible to share desks. We have telecommuting taking place, but as we hire new hires, they're not eligible for the first six months, along with if we want anybody in the office on a given day, we have to navigate around whether or not we have a desk available for them. Currently, we are borrowing desks from other departments to meet our needs. Mm -hmm. um, so we have vacant positions in other departments where we are lending their desks um, in the need to make sure we have the appropriate desk space available. So this request will allow us to purchase the appropriate equipment along with the hardware so everybody can have a desk. We can have all team members in office and we no longer have to depend on hiring cycle and or vacancies to make sure everybody has a place to sit when they're in the office. Yeah. Councilmember Cathcart and then Councilmember uh, Stratton. Well, I guess, so right now, you, you said you have 11 desks or 11 laptops, desks, et cetera, for yes. 16 employees. And yeah. so how many, how many typically work from home on an average on day or week? On any given day, we usually have about two to three people, depending okay. on the day of the week, because of the tele hybrid telecommuting policy. So, and we also have our front counter space. So what ends up happening is we're juggling people throughout the day. I have one of my managers floating, okay. um, moving between desks just on vac who's on vacation, whatever it may be to serve the need. So just to follow up, in terms of how you've made this work uh, up until now, uh, how would you, I mean, uh, put it on a scale, but, but like how urgent of a need is this? I'm just thinking about our budget woes and we have a lot of very difficult decisions to make and so I'm just curious. Yep, I have the remaining two positions for my customer service assistant position starting October 3rd. So I need to be able to get hardware at the very least, the desk space sharing we could make do um, for a little bit longer until our utility billing partners fill their positions and then those desks mm -hmm. would no longer be available. Is it, is it something that could, that could wait until January? I mean, until the new budget? Hardware, no. Um, Desk seating, yes, but I would have to allow individuals to work from home more frequently. Okay, all right, thank you. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. Just a question from out of nowhere. <laughs> okay. That space down there, yeah. is it cool when it needs to be and warm when it needs to be? Uh, cool when it needs to be, yes. Warm when it needs to be, no. Mm -hmm. Okay, because the, I mean, that's we've, been a problem for a while. We've purchased space heaters for every employee within my department that are under their desks to allow them to have warmth during the winter months. <laughs> okay, thank you. Any other to that, what Councilmember Katkar was saying, so in next year's budget, do you have a line item for equipment replacement? If there is a line item for equipment replacement and these additional will then fall into that replacement plan. There's a five year period, so we really mm -hmm. won't see those particular units needing to be replaced for a period of time. So we'll gradually work that into the budget over the years. Great, any other questions for Heather? Just confirming sponsors yeah. are, oh, the two of you. Mayor Bingo. Yeah. Council Mayor Bingo. Uh, yes, I, I will say those space heaters down there are pretty cool if you haven't seen them. They're pretty pretty space agey looking. But uh, in, that, in that space, do you have room for those extra desks? Uh, desks that you'd be putting in there? We do. So um, one of them is to replace desks from other team members that have moved to other locations temporarily. So that gives us our own hardware because right now we're borrowing other people's desks. Um, additionally, we dropped a network drop earlier in the year where now we have a place to put a desk that we did not before and utility billing is looking to add another desk into a workspace that will give us enough space for both my Spokane and the utility billing department to be on the first floor. Great. Hanalee, yes. I just wanted to confirm two sponsors on this at list, Councilmember Stratton and Wilkerson. Yes. Okay. 
All right. Thank you, Heather. Thank you. Okay, Councilmember Bingo, I think I really missed you sitting beside me today. So I look forward to seeing you. Next up is Thank you. Uh, code enforcement. Is Steve presenting on this today? Yes. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. Yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah, good afternoon, Chair and members of the, members of the council. I'm getting a feedback. Are you guys there? Yes. You're getting the same feedback? No. Okay, so I'll just get, I'll just talk through it then. Um, I, it's hard enough to hear me once, let alone twice. But um, so what, what's in front of you is a um, a SBO using salary savings to create the new director of code enforcement and parking services. Um, just a little history on this. In November 2021. Um, Parking was separated from Development Service Center and Code and Parking was all one department. Parking was taken out to create a new parking department and a department head position was not created at that time. So we're using um, salary savings from both code enforcement, the code enforcement fund and a parking fund um, to create this position. And at the end of the year, um, that new position will be triggered that will both handle parking services and code enforcement. I'm sorry, parking and um, code enforcement will be in one department at the end of the year. And this is just a, a step towards that at this point using salary savings. Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, so, so Steve, do we have um, uh, a director of parking then? We do. Um, that's, Louis, that's Luis Garcia. He's the interim director now and will soon be the proposed as the um, full-time director. And then what, what's happening then with code enforcement? And then um, code enforcement still technically is under DSC until the end of the year. And then that will be combined with parking and Luis will be the department head for both. Okay, so I guess what's the, what's the sustainable plan to fund this, like if we have to use salary savings to fund this now, what's the sustainable plan to ensure that we have the funding available come Jan 1 or our, our budget for 2023? Well, it's um, basically cost wise. Once you make a separate department of parking, we hadn't we're using salary savings because for this last year we haven't had a director there. And so um, we're we're accounting for that in next year's budget and one department head will be the department head of both code and parking. So we felt it was a, an efficient way to accomplish um, a, a department that made more sense and allowed DSC to focus on the increasing permit volume that they're having currently. Okay. Any other questions for Steve? Thank you, Steve. Just Thank confirming you. sponsors on that one again. Council Member Stratton and Council President. Okay, and I, I'm sorry, I just wanted to note, Council Member Bingle also wanted to be a third sponsor on that My Spokane item, and I confirmed via text, so I just wanted to note that. Thank you. Record. All right, Community Safety Act, Council Member Catcart. Yeah, thank you. So this is uh, real simple. Um, I had it in front of me here, that'd make, make it a little easier. Um, this is a pretty pretty simple change. Uh, it's already gone through legal. They've looked at it. They didn't have any red flags. Uh, the municipal court has it, and I know a couple of the judges are looking at it. They have not provided any feedback yet, so just, just want to be clear about that. Um, essentially what this does is it kind of follows what the new Seattle City Attorney is doing with recidivism in community court. Uh, the idea being that those who are um, repeat offenders should be redirected away from community court and towards alpha court. Uh, and so the idea behind this is that if you are, well, I'll just read what it says. So the addition is no defendant shall be referred to community court more than once in an eight month period, nor more than three times in a 36 month period. So the intent is simply to reduce recidivism and uh, those who are unable to um, um, stop getting cited for these sorts of issues would, would have to go to alpha court rather than community court if it's a recidivism issue. So that's, that's the point of this. Um, happy to answer any questions if there are any, and if not, um, we'll move ahead. 
Council Member Kernier, then Council President Egg, sorry. So I'm unclear as to how it will reduce recidivism. It, it, you're still committing a crime, you're just... Right, but there would be an actual penalty involved if they went to Alpha Court or could be a penalty involved if they went to Alpha Court. And so the idea is, and this is the same thing, and they've actually seen um, that it's working from what I've read in Seattle. Now theirs is a little different. Um, theirs is uh, one in eight months or 12 in five years. That seems pretty enormous to me. Um, but uh, I mean, when we have you know folks who are repeat offenders over and over again, still on the street committing crimes, that's an issue. And the idea is that if that's what they're doing, this is taking them off the street, hopefully. So. Council President. Can you get us the data? Because I would be skeptical that Alpha Court would reduce recidivism. It might make them suffer for a while and keep them away from treatment and things like that. But I'm not sure how it would actually get people to stop committing crimes unless it's un addressing the causes that community court does. So I'd love to see any some data on that. Sure. Okay. Council Member Bingle. Yeah, thank you. No, I'm 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 excited for this one. Uh, I know that we've, we've talked about uh, you know the, the state of public safety in our in our city right now, and uh, you talk to the chief and you talk to some others. Um, the thing that you hear is that there are you know roughly 75 people committing 50 percent of the crimes in the city of Spokane, and uh, what we've been doing. Is, is obviously not working, and uh, for us to make our, our city safer, I think this is a great step forward. So uh, I'm glad this one is coming up, and I do look forward to seeing the data uh, just the same as everybody else. Thank you. Council Member Zappone. Um, yeah, I was just wondering about, uh, I, I noticed the briefing paper didn't fill out any of the information about how this would impact different populations of people um, and how that data would be analyzed and collected. I was just wondering if you could speak to that. Um, yeah, well, I mean, it would affect everybody the same. I mean, it doesn't really matter what your background, religion, race, et cetera. I mean, everybody would be treated the same in terms of if you commit more than one. Um, if you're you know, referred to community court in an eight-month period, you can't be referred again in a year. Same for 36 months if you've been there three times. So um, everybody would have the same, same rules. It's just putting sideboards on community court um, so that it's not... Um, you know, just sort of a, a catch-all, and, and it really should be more, I think, pinpoint, pinpointed on those folks who are really trying to um, get away from some of the situations that they're in and some of the things that they're committing, and for those who just are unwilling or unable to do that, then there needs to be a different course of action. So, so my comment is, um, is this taking away the ability of the judges to make those decisions? I mean, in community court, they come before the judge, how many times or how many opportunities they get, are we trying to script that outside of our lane? That's, that's my concern. Well, I don't think it's outside of our lane, but, but I think what we're trying to do is to say, hey, we have, uh, as the council, we believe there should be a standard, and we don't think that just, you know, it should be so easy um, to, to continuously go back to community court. Um, so I, I, I think, yeah, I mean, in a sense, yeah, we're, we're prescribing something in, in law, but, um, but clearly what's happening right now is not keeping us safe, I would argue. Council members of home. And what sort of things do you, do people get, um, go to community court for? What kind of violations? Is it just drug related? Is it also things like bike helmet violations? Could be anything misdemeanor level. I mean, really, um, Obviously, there's a lot of, you know, the, the camping citations might go to community court. Um, you might have some low-level drug offenses, but, but then again, we're not issuing site, any referrals, so I doubt they're seeing hardly much of that at the, the municipal court level, at least here, maybe in other communities. Um, but yeah, it's that misdemeanor level, um, level crime. So we're not talking felonies. That's not what we're talking about. But potentially bike helmet violations. I, I suppose, I, I seriously doubt we've seen a ticket for a bike helmet violation since I've been here, but I mean, we can always look into that. Council President? Well, I was just gonna say it's, um, there's a list of crimes, but it does not include driving under the influence or domestic violence or assault, I don't believe. Um, and it also is geographically limited and it's police officers who refer them there usually. So, so yeah, my follow-up question to that then, are we treating all violations, three violations in 36 months, and it could be once for not wearing a helmet, another time for being caught with drugs, and that counts as a double violation when it's not for the same thing? Is that truly a repeat offender? 
yes. Because we, we have an email that the uh, city has said that they target people to stop them without a bike helmet to try to get them for other things. And so is that really a violation if they're not equally enforcing the law? Well, I mean, they have to have some, some sort of cause to stop you. I mean, if you're not wearing a helmet, they have the cause. So it's not like they're breaking the law in terms of, of the cause, in my view, but whether or not that's the best use of time. And frankly, we can always repeal that law if we're so opposed to it. I'd support that. Councilmember Stratton. I'm just curious, have, um, have folks from community court, the judges involved in community court, are they, do they know about this they, and have been? They have it, but they've not yet provided any comment okay. back. But we, we sent it to them a week ago. Okay, so if yeah. you get a comment, will you share oh, it with us definitely. so we know? Yep. Perfect, thank you. Councilmember Kinnear. Could we get the data on how, what's the community court referral now? So let's say in the last year, because community court was suspended during COVID, so mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. we don't have that. Um, yeah. And there was something else that I can't remember. Okay. Yeah, no, no worries. Well, my question, would it be a domino effect throughout the court system that they reach their limit and they go to the next court, then this, that increase the case slows there, so. Well, I would, I guess just one, one thought, maybe on some of the, the, um, the technical questions that we have, I don't know if Lyndon has any answers that he can provide right now. If not, we can always chat with him offline. But, right. um, but like I said, legal did, review this, no red flags were, were raised, but I don't know if there's anything to add, Linda. If, if you'd like, please move yeah. Please. Good afternoon, everybody. Lyndon Smithson, City Attorney's Office. Uh, thank you for calling me down. Um, so a, a little bit about community court, and this is definitely the policy level, so we can talk about this here, no problem at all. Um, we have had internal conversations in the prosecutor's office about something like this. We've talked about maybe limiting how many cases somebody can have in community court. Uh, because we, we want to focus on accountability and get people into treatment and get them out of committing crimes. So we, we've discussed this um, at that level. I think the courts have been, have been open to it because we don't want to see somebody with 10, 11 cases going through the system that, that they're not doing anything, right? So uh, definitely that's where we, where we would want to exclude them from community court. They would go to alpha court. The cases... The, the numbers in alpha court might expand a little bit, but they're not gonna <clears throat> overwhelm the judges. We're, we're used to pretty significant caseloads, and I think cases are down in the last two years anyway, so um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't worry as much about that. Uh, but we have had a focus on, on community court in the last few months. They've kind of been getting going again. There are a lot of cases that weren't being handled because people weren't coming to court. We could not issue warrants for a very long time. So there are a lot of people who are just kind of hanging out there and we weren't dealing with their cases. We are now, we're able to. And so um, that is a renewed focus. We're trying to be a little bit more effective. We're trying to get people into treatment, sustainable treatment, not just sporadically and hope, hopefully get them out of that process. But I'm absolutely here, here for any, any more questions. In, Chair Wilkerson. Yes, I, please. Um, I know COVID put, turned everything upside down, but before that, my understanding is that there were some studies, independent studies of our community court and whether or not it reduced recidivism uh, better than the alpha court. And do you, my understanding was that it did. Yeah, the problem that we saw is that it was pretty limited information. Um, our, new, our new case management system is going to be much more robust. We're going to have a lot more information. And, and, uh, but I, I think, no, I think the idea is, is, is right. It's, it's all about making sure that they're going through treatment and holding them accountable and making sure that, that um, they get out of that system. But fair to say that the last data we had was recidivism uh, was decreased in community court as opposed to alpha, and we don't really have data yet, COVID and the new system, so we're just kind of the jury, so to speak, is out on yes. that until we get the new data. I think it was three years ago, but it could have been long, as yeah. long ago as four because yeah. there's that two years that none of us remember. So, yeah, uh, yeah it could have been almost four years ago, but okay. yes, absolutely. Right. Thanks. Right. Councilmember Bingo. Yeah, I was I was gonna say the same thing on the you know bike helmet laws. Any laws like that that we're worried that are gonna be, you know, somewhat ticky tack that could that could uh, you know negatively affect folks. I'm I'm happy to, you know, uh, 
re repeal those. You know, I mean, even the, the water ban that we passed has a, has a misdemeanor offense in it. So I'm happy to revisit any ones that could be a uh, an issue for us on that. All right. I hear an ups and that's well of support for repealing the bicamera law. So, okay, that's <laughs> right. Well, um, I, was, I was just wondering if you could follow up with data about which things are people being violated for the repeat offenders, mm -hmm. because probably not everything. So, yeah. like, which are the things? And maybe we narrow the scope. I'll, I'll collect that. And so, just a little bit about that. Community court, as Council President mentioned, we don't have assault cases, we don't have domestic violence cases or DUIs. Mostly, you're looking at what we call lifestyle crimes, so trespass. Maybe there are some thefts down there. Um, it's low level misdemeanor crimes that people are committing downtown. Uh, sometimes we call them nuisance crimes, but they're basically, you know, bothering people, might be panhandling, that type of stuff. But we're not talking about DUIs, assaults, um, drug offenses. We don't really charge drug offenses any longer. So, mm -hmm. and those are felony level. So there really aren't any drug offenses. However, if you are, if you have chemical dependency issues, you might be causing thefts, trespasses, that type of stuff down, downtown. And that's when you come into community court, mm -hmm. you go through a robust evaluation. We determine if you have chemical dependency issues, if you have other sorts of issues, housing issues, those, those come up as well. It's a risk recidivism tool that we use. And um, at that point, we assess what is going to help you come out of this system. You get that at at the non-community court level as well. So it, it's available everywhere, but community court, that's the focus. Well, I look forward to hearing back from community court on their position and recommendations going forward. Do yes, you have a co-sponsor on this? Councilmember Mingle. Yep, I'm here. <laughs> co -sponsor. Of course. Are you, are you confirming your co-sponsorship? <laughs> Are you, just are you just confirming you're here? Which one is it? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Council Member Mingle. Next up, we're going to have the Wildland Fire Risk Reduction Grant from Chief Schaefer. Are you joining us by Zoom? Mm -mm. He is not there. He's not there. He pulled it. Is he fighting a wildland fire? Maybe we'll come back to that in just a minute. Uh, going forward, let's hear from... Uh, Mr. Piccolo on contract amendment and extensions, and I'll let you do both of those, uh, Mr. Piccolo. Good afternoon, Council. Yeah. So earlier earlier this year, the HR department hired a consultant through Archbright to help us with uh, the HR analyst work since we are currently very short-staffed. Uh, so we've had the person on staff under a minor contract. That contract expires first week of October. We want to extend that through the end of the year because we're still experiencing that short staffing. So this would continue the consulting contract with Archbright through the end of the year for an additional $54,000. And the second item is the SBO, where we're using uh, salary savings from all those vacancies to pay for this consultant. Uh, Colleen has been in the department now since uh, first part of July, doing a fantastic job. Again, the initial minor contract expires first week of October. We want to continue that through the end of the year. And hopefully by that time, the staffing situation, situation will be much better. Great. So. Any questions for Mr. Piccolo? Thank you, Mr. Right, thank Piccolo. You. Great. Uh, Lyndon, you're back up for um, outside council contracts. Good afternoon again. Thank you for having me. Um, and I believe this first one is about the Wise and Bacon mm -hmm. uh, with, with Summit Law. So, yeah. so Council, these are a couple of cases that we had with uh, firefighters that had sued the city These and also the governor. These were over uh, a mask mandate and also a vaccine mandate. We took those cases, uh, well, they were filed against us. We defended them. At a motion, we prevailed. Those cases were dismissed. Uh, they are now appealing those those decisions. They're appealing them to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. So we won in federal court. Now they're going one high, one step higher. So we're asking to add to those contracts with Summit Law Group. Summit Law Group helped us in uh, defending those. We were successful at that point, but 
as I come and tell you, there's always another level <laughs> until there isn't. We believe that if we, if we win at the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, we do not believe that the United States Court, I'm sorry, the United States Supreme Court would entertain this case, so we would likely be done at that point. Right. Councilmember Cathcart? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I believe, you know, we have a fiduciary responsibility and we have to support these sorts of things, but I'm especially challenged on, and I've supported the previous um, uh, dollars to, to add on to this, but I'm, I'm a bit challenged since the governor has dropped the mandate and I'm wondering, have we talked to those uh, individuals, um, talked about any sort of settlement that could include their job back? Uh, has, has, have those conversations been taken place? Well, so that's, they're kind of too, too mixed there because two, two questions there. Um, now that that has happened, we have had some conversations because a lot of those, those firefighters were working at the dispatch center so we're having internal conversations what that looks like because they may go back to yeah. their jobs. At the same time, they can continue their lawsuit. We can't, um, we can't keep them from continuing the lawsuit. And I, would, I will say the amounts that we're in, we're adding uh, 30,000 to each one of these. We could not settle it for that much. Okay. So I think yes. I know the answer to this, but I've got to ask because my brain's exploding. <laughs> so there's a possibility they're gonna get hired back, but they're also suing us. So, I mean, is that just the way the world works yes. legally? Okay. Yes. Wow. Yeah. A, a case is over when you run out of appellate courts or you withdraw your lawsuit. So we bring them back and what does that do to, because some of them has been working in dispatch, so we bring them back, they go to their regular jobs, and then our dispatch falls sure. apart. Sure, and now we're getting a little bit a little bit astray. We probably should talk about it in executive session, but, and these are also conversations at the fire department level. Mm -hmm. um, that's, those are policy issues. I, I mean, I don't really know what, what that looks like, but these are probably issues to talk about in executive session. And I believe we have executive session today. Can we add this to that agenda? That'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Any other questions on this summit law? All right, on to another special council contract. Are Thank you doing that or is Mr. Pickle doing that? Uh, no, it's, it's okay. me as well, right. yes. Thank you, and this is on the um, contract for Keenan Buckland McCormick. They are defending us in the David Novak uh, police involved shooting. The case actually started today, this morning. This, uh, I was at court this morning and uh, watch a little bit of the jury selection. So we're asking to increase this by another $300,000. The total will be $874,500. It's a large price tag, uh, but this will take us to the end of trial. And trial should be done in three weeks. I, I'll just speak first um, when this came before us because we had just approved another $250,000 just recently and I think we were all a little shocked with this price tag coming back. So you think this will take us through the end of this trial because we kept talking about discovery, 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 um, and then the other things that go around this trial as we settle with the father, correct? Exactly, yes, yes. And so that's part of it as well. We settled with the father. Um, that is, I believe, in, in this 874,000. So $275,000 of that was the settlement with the father. And, and you are correct, Council, Council Member Wilkerson, the cost has gone up quickly, uh, mm -hmm. but that is trial preparation. Um, those are the discovery issues. Trials kind of start out slow and hit a fevered pitch when you're actually going to trial. Uh, a lot of what our prep was to hopefully avoid trial, but that, that hasn't happened. So mediation is totally off the table. We're, it is, okay. it, it, we tried it and it didn't take. Gotcha. Councilmember Cathcart. Are the, the dollars for this, are they in budget or is it an SBO that's necessary? Uh, it's an SBO. That, it's not, it's a, it's I believe an SBO. it's an SBO, but it's I'm not SBO. positive. So, so my follow-up to that is how do we, when we're preparing the budget um, for your department, do we look back at all of the dollars that we spent the previous year or kind of over the last few years and try to 
get get that number correct in terms of how much you're going to need, or is it? I think that's difficult because we never know. And, and clearly, this is on the on the policy side. I think right. we can talk about that. We just don't know. I think we do have reserves and risk. Risk kind of sets those out. Uh, we also know that in each one of these lawsuits, we only are pay out a maximum of 1.5 million, okay? So after that, an excess carrier kicks in. So those are kind of issues as far as that goes, but we, we just don't know. We don't know when one of these lawsuits is gonna be filed and we're gonna settle it quickly and it's not gonna go to a protracted out to trial or when you know once every two or three years we're gonna get a case that goes all the way to trial and it, it racks up an ex a larger sum than we would expect. So I, I know we're going to talk budget in a minute, but I would just throw this out there. I think same as overtime. I, I really think we should be extremely specific and maybe even overestimate in the budget for these and then come back mid-year, do a supplemental, and we can, you know, fi fix anything that we might have put too much in the budget on. But I just think that we're under-preparing ourselves for these things. Like, we have to have an SBO for this. We have to have an SBO for all the overtime. I mean, all this is not planned for. And so I just really think, you know, this is – finance committee and I think it's really important that we think about putting it in the budget how much we're really going to be spending so that we're not in this situation. I agree. I think those conversations would be productive um, with risk management and the city, city attorney's office. I, I, think, I think those are good ideas to talk yeah. about these. Council Member Kinnear. So in terms of other cases, is this, um, this seems unusually high. Is that your impression as well? I, I would say it has been an anomaly in the last few years. This is painful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Council member, council president. I was just going to say that the briefing paper says it is within the budget. So oh, it was okay. planned for. And I do, I just want to highlight a point um, Lyndon made, which is our insurance arrangements and, and agreements for outside counsel is we, on any particular case, we are capped at that 1.5 million. And in a case like this where we didn't get rid of the case on summary judgment, so there's a chance that it is. That means we're, you know, probably going to be paying something. We, it's not as bad as it looks in this. The danger is if there are a lot of cases up to the 1.5 million. It's not so much of a danger for any one case like this that does. But if our, uh, particularly in our police department, are doing things that you know, a judge isn't throwing out because reasonable jurors could have different opinions on it. That's going to be where we're really going to be at risk. So it's not so much one case, even though this case is a painful case and gets a lot of publicity. So. Right. I'm glad I'm not coming to you on a fifth or sixth for this year. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll just have to echo Councilmember Kat Carr as we serve on the budget committee uh, that we are really challenged um, and we have some grave concerns over the budget. Um, we've had discussions of even suspending all SBOs just so it's out there for the rest of the year until we can right size this ship and really what uh, is a reasonable budget cut request going forward. So everybody knows uh, the purse strings are really tight. Is there anything, um, thank you, Lyndon, thank you're you, off the hot seat. It. Mr. Matt Boston, you can follow that with the uh, strategic budget discussion, please. Uh, I also believe that uh, Chief Schaefer's on. Oh, all right. Well, let's go to Chief Schaefer if he's on the line. Chief Schaefer. Hey, everybody. Hey there. I, I am really sorry about uh, the mix up there. I'm actually out of town and technologically uh, disabled at some level, but I, I want to take the opportunity and just uh, explain a little bit about this grant opportunity. It's a, a federal grant. Uh, you allowed us over the last two years the ability to uh, create and adopt the Wildland Urban Interface Code and then uh, allowed us to hire a position to facilitate that work. The next step is for us to start treating fuels. The city owns a majority of the fuels that need to be treated in Spokane that have been have been identified as a uh, imminent hazard, especially with um, uh, the wildland urban interface and uh, its threat uh, to carrying fire into our infrastructure, into neighborhoods and such. So what this grant would allow us to do is essentially provide $1.5 million of funding to treat 100% of 
that risk and by treating it, it would it would depend on the type of situation. It may be goats, it may be masticators, it may be chippers, and it may be humans doing this work, but it would allow us to contract uh, through our partners at DNR for approximately 200,000 match on that $1.5 million. This grant opportunity um, is scalable. So I think from a risk perspective, obviously one fire, uh, one fire and one home loss is well over $1.5 million, especially if it would occur in city property. So um, the, the amount of match is dependent on actually the amount of risk tolerance we have in our community. So I'm asking today just for permission to apply for the grant as it's written by the uh, fire uh, planner and the fire marshal, but then come back to you if we have any semblance of approval. Um, if, if we do get approved, then we'll come back to the policymakers, explain the details and the plan, and then um, specifically get down to the nuts and bolts for funding. But right now it's more of just an approval to move forward in this part of the we're in this first phase of uh, entering into the uh, into the group with probably uh, several hundred, maybe even thousand other communities across the, the West and uh, some of the areas in the Southwest that will be applying for the same fund. Thank you, Council Member Catcar. Yeah, you, you mentioned that this is uh, entirely, or it sounded like I heard you say it's entirely uh, city owned. Uh, property or assets that, that you're looking to protect. And I'm just kind of curious, what types of assets do we have out in the wildland urban interface? That's a great question, council member. Uh, first off, the, the assets, and, and most of them rely uh, in the uh, public works division. Mm -hmm. Think about uh, Aubrey White, uh, along Aubrey White, where we have the water treatment system. Uh, a number of pump houses and support structures uh, for the water distribution system and the sewer treatment system, as well as uh, a number of buildings, including our fire station. And then uh, simply, you know, if, as we've identified all of this risk, uh, if, we, if we don't move forward in treatment and, and begin to treat this and uh, be responsible, I think with, the property that we do have or be more responsible. Um, we, we're assuming a, a really high level of risk, especially if the fire carries into uh, neighborhoods like we've seen in Colorado Springs and across uh, all of California, most recently in Oregon and Malden. Um, once, once the fire is started, obviously the origin of the fire, uh, if it would be on, on city property or carried by city fuels, can certainly assume uh, level of liability, and that's what we really try to do. I mean, the more profound reason is to protect property and life, absolutely. And then also a part of this is, is also to reduce the liability and the risk to the city, and then probably tertiary is to um, is to be the model. And uh, the model, you know, when we go out and speak to these neighborhood groups and speak to people about um, living with fire and being fire adapted and um, pushing uh, our uh, levels one, two, and three or the three different phases from your home with reducing fuels. We want to be able to do the same thing for all the city on property as well. No, that, that's, that's really helpful. So these are not just assets, but, but pretty critical assets that we really, really need to protect. So that's, that's helpful to know. My, my last question is just, do you, do you think that there might be opportunities down the road for, uh, future grants that we could use to help protect uh, any of like, like private um, or, or, you know, nonprofit type assets that might be in these areas or, or work with them uh, to some degree to help firewise around them? I've been told yes. And what's, what's interesting uh, when we map all of this, this property is that um, city parks has a large amount of property that is adjacent to many of our neighborhoods, almost all of our neighborhoods. And that obviously is probably the, the number two um, focus, like the most recent fire that we saw up on the hill off of Government Way was uh, a city park and uh, obviously threatened the neighborhoods that were near. And I think 
from my understanding is that once you're in the system, once you're in the federal system and um, everything's measured, we once we actually uh, take action and uh, reduce fuel or treat fuel in a certain area, it goes into the Interra program, which is tracked by the federal government and DNR. So as we show progress and we show success, they um, they offer more opportunity, and we become a, a trusted partner with uh, the entire process. So I think we're we're definitely on the front end of this, uh, and there could be some more opportunity for us for not only nonprofits, but I think some targeted um, assistance to some of our most vulnerable neighborhoods that may not have the ability to uh, help with fuel treatment. Great. Thank you, Chief Schaefer. Anything else? Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you back soon. I hope so, too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Mr. Boston. Let's talk about the strategic budget. <laughs> okay, so most of this uh, information that we're presenting today is, is, isn't new. It's, it's what we've been talking about for the past several weeks. Um, oh, I got to share thanks. it. <laughs> thanks, Emily. Um, appreciate it. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, really what we're going to be talking about is uh, the, the discussions that the Budget Committee has had over the last several weeks, um, looking at those level one, level two priorities that we've, that we've been discussing, as well as the level three, um, and where they fit into things. Um, going to review the unallocated fund balance over the last uh, the last several years. I think we went back to 2015 to what it would be at after uh, this action. Discuss the implications of the next actions. Discuss what other municipality best practices are. That is in response to uh, Councilmember Cathcart's uh, request last last week or the year, uh, the week before, uh, and then review administration's projections for upcoming years. Uh, again, just to review really quick, the Council Budget Committee remained focused on level one and level two budget challenges as other funding requests need to be postponed based on limited, limited funding availability. We looked previously and we'll look again, uh, but really the, the two main funding opportunities that we have here for, for level one, two, and three is going to be that uh, unallocated reserve as well as the, uh, the ARPA funds. If we were to sum all of the needs, wants in level one, two, three with what we have in reserves as well as ARPA, we surpass that uh, many times over. Well, not many times over, but we surpass that. So level one, just as a reminder, there's about 12 and a quarter million. The level one uh, requests are um, all things that we've already agreed upon, collective bargaining agreements being the primary focus there, as well as a uh, $750,000 payment out to the, um, the, the, um, the business, uh, PDAs. the PDAs, yes. Um, and then level two, uh, 10.65 million, primarily driven by public safety overtime. Again, this is just an estimate, uh, 10.65, we, we know 3.4 million um, is what the administration is projecting. Um, I'm, I'm pretty much on that exact projection as well. Uh, what I'm seeing is about a $4 million police overtime. Um, from, from my understanding, I, th I think administration is a little, bit, uh, a little bit different in their projections on that. We'll wait to hear from that. Um, it, it obviously will be something that we have to pay before the end of the year, we can't go into 2023 with that deficit there. Um, and so those are the level one and level two. For this exercise, I didn't touch the, the $4 million estimated in police overtime, because again, that is a projection that I'm seeing. Um, it's not necessarily the administration's. So this is what we, and I apologize for the small font, but this is <laughs> the best I could do with all of this. Uh, again, on the left-hand side, level one, Level two is in that blue box there. We're seeing the 12 and a quarter uh, broken out with the, the different uh, collective bargaining agreement uh, costs that are associated with it, as well as the PDA retro, the police overtime, as well as the fire overtime. Um, again, we're seeing anywhere between three and $4 million, so just trying to be conservative. Uh, the homelessness operations, while it says funded there, I just want to remind everybody that is funded through 2022. That is not funded through 2023. We did see uh, a request for an SBO come through for the <coughs> remainder of the funding 
uh, for the 2023 operations where there's about a three and three quarter million, so $3.75 million shortfall for uh, funding of operations into 2023. Again, uh, that number could grow, that number could shrink, but, but keep that in kind of your mind's eye as you're looking at things. M&P negotiations, we all know that those uh, discussions are still going on, so we don't want to put anything up there. Uh, but based on the discussions that have been had, you could probably imagine a number there and, and what that impact might be. Level three uh, are going to be the, the urgent uh, requests from the administration that have come by. Uh, or come through, the public safety equipment being uh, one of them, utility assistance. Again, that is, you know, a great program because not only does it help the internal city government, but it also helps our external customers as well. Park insolvency fund support, homelessness support. Um, we've requested additional information on that $10 million number. We don't know if it's directly relatable to ch the Trent shelter. We don't know if it's for um, the... Uh, uh, Catholic Charities 2.0, um, but we're waiting to get uh, a little bit more information on that. But that nets out to their highest priorities at about 22.8 million. And then level three, um, right now, again, these are all postponed um, for, for the immediate, except for the South Suspension Bridge. There is discussion about having that South Suspension Bridge cost come out of the RE2 funding dollars um, if it ends up in the capital plan. So, this really just illustrates where all of those different costs are going. The 270 and the, uh, the, the first line on the 270, the $1.5 million, that is, again, as a reminder that that is the, the reserve that was, uh, that was squirreled away by the council um, when we are developing the uh, 2022, or we are amending the 2022 budget. Uh, 948,000 was uh, a reserve for budget allocation that the administration had identified for um, the uh, the fire uh, the fire bargaining agreement combined making about 2.5 million dollars. Those two red lines go directly to the payroll reserve, netting that out to zero dollars. Obviously, uh, the big one uh, is is again going to be going to be the unallocated reserves. As we see in the last slide, we started that at about two and a half million dollars at the beginning of this exercise. The beginning of the year, just as a reminder, and we'll talk about this in a second, um, but the beginning of the year, we started at about 15.8 million uh, with uh, the police car purchase uh, buy aheads that we auth that council authorized, as well as I believe the um, the um, election expense came through and, and netted that out to about 12 and a half million. ARPA, again, that is with everything that's gone through so far being allocated. Um, that is not the, the overall spend. There is money left in ARPA. Yes. And you, you might get to this, but will you talk a little bit about uh, what we talked about last week with regards to bond ratings and what Absolutely. other communities yeah. are doing? Yep. Okay. Um, yep. Getting there. Um, so moving forward again, or well, forward to back. Um, again, all of the other bargaining agreements uh, going into those unallocated reserves. The reason, uh, and this, is, this was administration's re recommendation as well, um, was because if we were to have saved more, like we were asking to last year, it would have impacted that unallocated reserve. That balance would have been less, or they would have had to, um, or the, the, the city would have had to uh, create further budget efficiencies to save in that amount so that that number would be impacted in some way. Um, that's, that's the most reasonable uh, category to pull from. Um, but it, it, it still doesn't make it palatable at the, at the same time. The $3.4 million, there is the proposal to go to ARPA. Um, again, you know, the, the, the reason behind that, and this came from administration as well, the reason behind that, I believe, um, in administration and council's eyes was um, that those overtime costs were most likely directly attributable to the COVID pandemic. It was absences that we were seeing. It was, um, you know, vacancies that we saw because of the, uh, the uh, restrictions that were in place. So that makes the most reasonable place to pull. Unfortunately, but truly, that brings unallocated reserves down to uh, just shy of $3 million at $2.7 million and ARPA down to $10.4 million. Um, 
And then again, that's that's the the the, the yellow line there is just possible if if uh, council decides to move for council and administration decide to move forward to fund the uh, south suspension bridge out of the re two dollars just because it is an allowable expense under that classification. Matt. Matt. Yes. I've got to challenge you on something you said okay. uh, that the over police and fire overtime are likely a result of COVID and uh, fire overtime. Fire overtime. Yeah. Uh, so. I, well, I'm going to go on to say that both police and fire overtime have been an issue mm -hmm. since I've been on council, mm -hmm. since you've been on council, since you've been on council. So we're the three people who've been on the longest. Um, it's never been dealt with. And so you can point to COVID, but it's not a COVID issue. It's been a problem. Well, now, COVID made it perhaps worse. Right. But it's been a problem right. since we've been on council. So. Right. It's never been handled, and we have to absolutely get a handle on it. Absolutely, and I think um, in moving for the, the 2023 projections and some of the projections that I've seen from administration, they are, they are identifying that in their, in their projections for 2023's budget, whereas in 2022, we didn't see any increase in the, the overall budget for fire overtime when we knew we were gonna be in that sticky situation come 2022 based on the vacancies that we already had. But I believe that they're projecting that for 2023 being an issue already and, and budgeting accordingly for that. Can you give us the figure again? I know you, I asked you before, what's the figure that we had? What, what did we have in reserves in 2019? Yeah, we'll get, we'll get there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Catcart. Yes. Yeah, well, and I was just going to piggyback on, on that. And I think that's, that's a really good point, you know, that, that we have had these issues ongoing. And so I think, and I've said this before, but if we can identify what we expect our overtime is going to be next year, and if we're putting it in the budget, then I hope we're being accurate. We're not right. under, you know, lowballing that figure. Um, but I hope we can identify what that is. And then to me, you take the delta between the two, and that's what you use your one-time funds on, mm -hmm. because we're going to have ongoing expenses in overtime. And so I'm... I mean, I'm going to be a stickler for not using any one-time funds for ongoing expenses. And right. so that to me is kind of the way we should address that, I think. Yeah, and, and, and definitely exercise that we can, we can uh, take on when we get a little bit closer. Um, I, I think we, we need to be realistic uh, when, when we're looking at 2023 projections uh, based on the, you know, the, the, the quantitative data that we have. I mean, when we were looking at 2022, um, it's, you know, Arguably, we knew we were going to be in a problem going into 2022 already just based on the vacancies that we had. So uh, based on the vacancies, based on the fact that COVID was still a real thing that every, that every city in the country was dealing with, we knew that that was going to be a, uh, an issue that, that um, arguably should have been adjusted accordingly so that we could actually project and say, okay, th this is going to be something that we need to save, fun, save from rather than go into those one-time costs retrospectively. Um, and I think that that's what you're trying to say is let, let, let's look at it prospectively. Let's get ahead of it. Let's budget for it. And if, and if there is one time need that is on the horizon for it, let's put it into that budget based on that. Not to be Debbie Downer, but we do that every year. And it never, never. I don't. Yeah. So yeah, every year we say that. Go ahead, Matt. Okay. Uh, oh, moving forward. So that Brought to the next slide. So this is um, talking about the the unallocated fund balance based on the financial statements that have been here for the past several years. So going back to 2016, uh, we saw $19 million in the uh, unassigned fund balance per the financial statements, uh, 17 bumping up to uh, 27.5 million, 2018 to nearly 25 million, 2019 to 28.1. Uh, in the, the delta between the 2019 and the 2020 number is when we fully funded the, um, the revenue replacement uh, reserve uh, in, in the tune of about $7 million there. So it is still sitting in there from my understanding. Uh, started the year in 2021 it, with about 15.8. Uh, those, those financial statements have been audited, but they have not been released yet. So the, I'm just using a rough number there. Um, and then if we were to move forward with this, uh, we get down again to just shy of, of um, $3 million. As you can see, it's problematic looking at 2020 to 2022, we see a 26%, a 24% and an 83% drop in our, uh, our uh, unassigned fund balance, which is, which is problem. Um, and then again, a graph just below. 
um, what that does, you know, kind of the implications that it, that it, it could pose for us is a possible bond rating implication. Um, we know that um, when the um, bond rating agencies are out there, they're looking at our overall financial health. When you are pulling out assets, um, your, your unassigned, your unallocated assets to that degree, um, it is going to raise some red flags. Um, I, I think that in um, past years, um, in reading some of the Moody's reports, uh, they, they had explicitly stated that, you know, um, any sort of substantial changes to the financial, and, and don't quote me exactly on this, but the, the financial um, stability of, of the uh, city um, would be cause for a rating decrease. Uh, and likewise, you know, alternatively on the, on the flip side, anything that was going to get us a, um, a, a rating increase was going to be if we had uh, increased our reserves. I know in talking to um, some of the other uh, finance officers that were here years ago, I, I think that um, when they were going down and talking about the ratings uh, on a yearly basis, uh, even in those discussions with their previous financial analyst, they were having issues with that $25 billion uh, amount still being a little bit low on the low end. Um, again, another, uh, another problem that it could pose is the ability to fund unexpected emergencies. Now, granted, we still do have the contingency reserve account, um, and as probably everybody remembers, there are some strict guardrails on that, on what we can spend and when we can spend that. It is unforeseen, it is emergent, it is um, problematic, not what we're spending um, these funds for and not how we're spending, uh, not how we're spending the, the uh, unassigned balance. And then possible cash issues. At that point in time, when we have uh, really burned through a significant amount of our unassigned fund balance, and we're in that cyclical um, revenue cycle of property taxes where we receive large chunks of cash on a, on a two time a year basis, there could be situations where we're borrowing from the contingent, you know, theoretically borrowing from the contingency fund because uh, we don't have the cash at that point in time, the actual cash to um, fund it from the unassigned balance. Another question that Council Member Cathcart asked last week was uh, what, are, what are best practices um, and what do we see across the state, what do we see across the country? Um, just in some some high-level searches, uh, we could see that the GFOA, which is the, um, what, gosh, the financial, financial officers of, the government financial officers of America, best practice, typically no less, and this is pulled directly from the MRSC website, typically no less than 60 days or two months, so about 16.5 to 16.7 percent of operating expenditures for the general fund. For the city of Spokane, that's approximately 35.6 to 36.1 million in the current year that we're supposed to, that theoretically is best practice. City of Issaquah, this is other municipalities on assigned policies. City of Issaquah, the general fund balance should be approximately 15 to 20% of expenditures in the general fund. The unassigned balance may never fall below 15% of the operating expenditures unless authorized by the city council. City of Redmond, the city will maintain a general operating reserve of at least 8.5% of the total fund budgeted revenue. City of Bainbridge Island, the city shall remain a minimum fund balance of 25% of ongoing revenues in the general fund. So you're seeing that, you know, it, this shies, if, if council is to go with this action, if council is to go with administration's recommendation, it, it is going to be a, a, a pretty significant departure from um, what best practices are out there. Matt? Yeah. So we don't currently have anything in code that requires a, a percentage in... Not in our unassigned. Yeah. We, we have it for our contingency, we have it for our revenue stabilization, um, and then we have it for... Oh, gosh, I can never remember what the third one is, but yes. And I'll, I'll ask the same question of our, our CFO, but I'm just curious, do you, do you think we should adopt some kind of a requirement on that, and do you have a recommendation of what that should be? Uh, I, I mean, I, I, would, I would argue that the, the, the best recommendation is going to be um, coming from the GFOA. I mean, I, I, I think that is, is, is kind of the gold standard of 16.5 of to 6, I mean, you know, two months of, of cash on hand. I mean... Even as a, and this is just going into um, a, a little sideline, but even as a, um, an own, your own personal expenses, I mean, that, that, that should be a, a, 
a general rule for you is just kind of have two months of cash on hand. But that, that would be my opinion. Okay. Council members of home. Yeah, I just wanted to double check, clarify. So those best practices is not their contingency. That's a different. That is They different. have an additional yes. contingency. This is just for their unassigned. <clears throat> so moving forward, this is um, the, the administration's projections of, of what we're seeing. Now, granted, this, this came to us in um, August of this year. And, I, and um, from my understanding, it, it's only updated twice a year. Um, and the last time that this was updated was in June. So you're going to see some things that aren't quite on here and some things that have, have changed a bit. Um, most importantly, I would say the, the significant amount of it is, is the, the labor agreements at the top. Those are mostly accurate up to the, obviously the M&P 2.5%. Uh, the equipment and capital, um, we have, the, the council has uh, authorized what, what is going to be purchased in the current year. Um, that 1.3 and that 1.5 in unfunded amount, you can then expect, even if it's not funded in this current year, it is going to trickle into future years until it is actually paid for. So that 1.3 and that 1.5 will remain constant until it's th that equipment is actually purchased. Um, in 2023 fire equipment and 2023 police equipment, we obviously know that the police equipment has a portion of that that has uh, been purchased for the purchase aheads of about two and a half million dollars. Um, but we do not see any public safety equipment past 2023. We know that that is, is, is probably just not been updated quite yet and that there will be needs in 2024 and beyond. Um, I, I would argue that the 5.3 and the 5.1 are probably uh, good benchmarks to just put in that projection for future years. Um, the warming and cooling shelters that we talked about, we know that those are, those are in there in this current year. The fire overtime, that 4.5 million um, has been decreased down to 3.4 million. The 750,000 in retro payments, uh, the $250,000 in election, those are, all con those are all included in the in the discussion that we just had. And then the studies we haven't touched because that was considered by council as kind of a level three. Having said that, <clears throat> uh, we, we know that the uh, administration's projections for revenue right now, um, based on, on the report that we received, I believe to be a bit high, not significantly high. Um, I, I, I think they're going to be a little. I think they're going to come in a little bit less than that. But I think expenses might also come in a little bit low. So there could be a, a, a decent size gap in the current year. But there isn't the trench shelter included in these projections, as well as again, like I said, public safety capital not included in the projections in 2023 and, or 2024 and beyond. So if you were to include the six and a half million dollars six and a half to seven million dollars in each one of those years as well as ten million dollars in the uh, of public safety capital in the f in the um, following years that aren't included you could obviously see where the deficits are just from the administration's own projections back in june that is where um i i believe council as the council budget committee has, has discussed a little bit of of what they would like for next steps for administration we obviously know that we're going into the 2020 budget season. We're going into 2023 budget planning. Um, I, I think what is being echoed with all of council is that there is a, a, a budget shortfall where it's going to land. We don't know. Um, I, and, and I would just ask the council as a whole right now uh, for what you would like myself to do and how you would like me to hand over everything to administrations, how, how we could facilitate the, the the best handing of the baton. Are you going to speak, Councilmember Kinnear? Yes, uh, Matt. Is there a policy in place that would aggregate the SBOs? Because it seems to me this year has been unusual in the number of SBOs that have been requested of us. And so, when you do these one-offs, we don't have a big picture of. They're taking little tiny bites and chunks out of a budget, and then it gets six months down the road, and you're thinking, um, that's a lot of money that just got, that just took wing out of the, the reserves. Right. Is there something that we could put in place 
that would give us a better handle on when those, or some kind of benchmark or some process where pe the departments aren't seeing this as a cash cow, oh, we've got reserves, we'll just go after those, or we have yeah. general fund money. Yeah, I, well, there, there is actually kind of in, in a roundabout way, I mean, th th there could be something that's broadcast a little bit brighter, um, but there is those general fund updates based th that, that are financial. I believe they're either quarterly or biannually that, that give a rundown of all of the SBOs that have, that have gone through so far in this year, where they came from, mm -hmm. and what the implication was of, of those funds. Now, I think what you're asking for is more of a prospective approach rather than um, yes. Okay, so I think we can we can work with administration on getting that when when SBOs are coming up, what you know um, what what may be presented and what the implication of the the general fund or whatever fund that they're pulling for from is um, impacted and how it's impacted. Um, so that's that's something that we can definitely work towards. And, that, and I think it would be helpful. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, on that, I mean, that's very similar to what I've been trying to ask for, and I just think it'd be great for, for us, but even better for the public if it could just be printed right on our agenda what the budget impact is of, frankly, any financial decision that we make, but certainly yeah. the SBOs. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, in reality, I mean, uh, yeah, let, let me see if I can work with uh, Jessica, Jake, Tanya, and mm -hmm. see if we can get something that could um, visually put it out there, so that so that we see what you know the overall um, not only dollar financial impact it, impact is, but what the um, percentage impact is, because I think that that's also really helpful. And again, if this is an ongoing thing, I mean, we have that on the brief, we have that on the briefing mm -hmm. papers, um, but you know how how to put a spotlight on it is is um, the, the tricky part. And so how do we put a spotlight on it? So that's, that's where your eyes go first, I, I think is uh, gonna be the tricky part, but I think it's something that we can do. And then just the, the, the three things we talked about in the budget committee, um, and I certainly wanna hear what everybody else has to say, but we're um, essentially asking the administration for a pause on SBOs, potentially a pause on hiring, and a, uh, uh, some sort of, of recommendation on up to 15% in cuts uh, or cost reductions. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, I still believe all three of those are probably very necessary. I think mm -hmm. there could be some uh, extenuating circumstances on a hiring or an SBO, but, but I think generally speaking, we need to probably put a pause on all of that so that we can get a handle on things. And you mentioned earlier, like just as a great example, you know, oh, well, we can pay for this project out of REIT 2 because it's a permissible use. Well, what are other permissible uses? Right. And you know, until until I know like what all the potentialities are for these different buckets, right. I just don't think we should be doing anything until we get that all lined up and straightened out. Yep, so. absolutely. And I think it is. Uh, I mean, I, I know it's a it's a heavy lift. It, it is mm -hmm. absolutely a heavy lift to to say fifteen percent going into an upcoming budget season, um, and it, it is going to be a um, difficult amount and and obviously as we can see if we're just looking at these numbers and we input the six and a half million and the public safety capital into that we don't see a 15 percent deficit really the the 15 percent number that i think that i've heard the budget committee talk about isn't 15 percent because that's where we see the deficit at it's 15 percent so that we can build those reserves back right. we're looking at you know um going from a, a very not very healthy, but a, a, a healthy reserve into a um, an unhealthy one, really. And and how do we build that back so that we don't face this problem in the future? And I think that's where the 15% comes from. I think there were some um, there were some um, informal conversations about the 15%. If that is a direction that is is where council is really wanting to go, I think it needs to be. Um, formally addressed to to the administration so that they can prepare for that so that we're not scrambling to try to do that last minute and, and not necessarily across the board i mean using right. a scalpel being right. smart about right. it but right. yeah, yeah. I'd, add, I'd like to add a fourth thing okay. to that. council member Kinnear. thank you sorry um i'd like to add a fourth and that would be to use the remainder of our arpa funds to get us back on track and i know that's People are going, oh, no, that's for the community. We need, and I've said this a hundred times, mm -hmm. we need to make ourselves healthy and whole first. So that would be my ask. Let's spend the, the remainder of our ARPA money to uh, make the agency 
the municipal government whole. And Council Member Kinner, that's been a conversation, but there's nowhere enough money in ARPA to make us whole. I know it, that. It, it would be a drop, it, absolutely. But it's, it's a drop. It, it's, it's, a, it's a drop, absolutely. Yeah. But the 15% cut for me is like, we have got to start squirreling away some money for the future. That uh, unallocated uh, reserves is, ex in any family, I would be concerned. Mm -hmm. So we got a lot of angst. How do we build that up, <clears throat> even if it's little by little? We have to do something going forward. Right, right. And, and it is, I mean, it, it's a significant challenge. Um, as we can probably all imagine that that if we're looking at an overall general fund budget being approximately 216 million dollars and we're looking at the personnel cost of that 216 million dollars um, be about 167 million dollars of which we are compounding on a five percent annual rate annual raise each year based on the uh, bargaining agreements that we just passed it it is going to break through the ceiling year and year again. So there has to be a formalized long-term plan, not just a short-term plan of how we get through 2022 or how we get through 2023, because that, that, that upper echelon is just gonna crack through that, that revenue growth that we have, and it's gonna burst through it where we're gonna have these challenging conversations every year. Councilmember Kinnear. And one other thing, not to belabor this, but Previous councils, um, the three of us included, worked very hard to save that money mm -hmm. and squirrel it away. And so it, it's doubly painful to seat down as low as it is, v very much so. So I'm all in favor of doing that. Thank I you. just want you to know I'm picturing little squirrels <laughs> in my brain, the in the, yeah. squirreling it away. Yeah. Before we go down uh, Council Member Stratton's rabbit hole, Squirrel is there hole. any squirrel hole? I'm sorry. Is there anything else to come before the finance committee? Not to my knowledge. I, I, I guess I would ask if we could um, come up with some formalized plan. And I don't know if that's specifically from the budget committee. I would ask the council. I would ask the entirety of council if we would like to uh, come up with a formalized plan that we are. Um, passing through resolution or a memo that we are sending to administration so there's no ambiguity yeah. on what the plan is moving forward. Um, I, I think there's a lot of discussions floating around. There's a lot of ideas that are flowing around. Um, I think, you know, somebody might grab onto one and somebody else might grab onto another and expectations might, might not be met. And that's not where we want to be in a month, two months as we're trying to finalize this budget. Just a quick yes. question. So when we talk about the, I think you said 15% reductions, mm -hmm. does council, can council kind of um, put some rules around those? I mean, is that in our purview? Can we look at those 15, that 15% and say, this is where we'd like to see yeah, so this it's is what we see happening and what we not see happening, right, what we don't want right. happening. So it's a challenge for, I, I think, administration and council right now because administration is funding based on policy that's already existing. Mm -hmm. right. So when we're, when we're asking for a 15% uh, reduction in expenses while, um, being, while staying level with the same policy that we're at right now, there needs to be a discussion of where where would that 15% pull from? Right. Um, you know, obviously we're, we're talking really about the general fund because that is, it, that is the one that's gonna be hit hardest. How do, the general, how do the general fund policies impact the fiscal, the, the, the fiscal part of, of you know, what that policy is? And, and how can we change or how can we put guardrails on those policies to make sure that they're um, within the funding concept that you're thinking of of 15% if that's if that's where council wants to go. I'm yeah. going to ask council member Cat Cardis after 3 o'clock. I'll be really fast. Oh, really fast. Really okay. fast. <laughs> I was just just going to say I mean I think the administration can can choose to provide us with the 15% or not. They could do 5. They they could do kind of anything in terms of recommendations. We would maybe have to have some harder decisions at that point, but we could always ask them to put certain, you know, yeah, guardrails around what those recommendations would be. I think it would be great, though, to, to really see from them what, what is the 15% that is sort of the, 
you know, the areas that, that, you know, make the most sense because theoretically that would come from department heads and, and people who are in the weeds who right. know what, what can go and what can't. And so I'd really like to get that kind of on the ground input. Yeah. And that's what I was even thinking. People who make so much a year, would they be willing to take a cut and pay for a while or something? I don't know. I'm just Gosh. thinking. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's, there's a, there's a lot of creative opportunities yeah. that are out there. Um, but I, I, I think exactly. like, like Councilmember Cathcart said, I, I think it really needs to come from administration. It needs to come from department heads. They, they need to have um, the management finger on the pulse to say, hey, yes, it's, it's not going to be an easy pill to swallow, but this is where I can, I can create efficiencies within my department. There's absolutely no way I can do it over here. Right. It, and, and, you know, oftentimes council says, well, okay, we didn't quite get to the, the budget constraints that we wanted to, so we're going to go at it with a blindfolded chainsaw, and, and it, it doesn't create the same sort of impact that it needs to. And it, quite frankly, it's not efficient. No. Right. Thank you, everyone, for joining Finance. Our next meeting will be October 17th. Have a good afternoon. Great.